this Sunday begins uh, a pause in our Luke series, and throughout the summer, where as has been the habit of our summer rhythm, we will have a summer mixtape series where a number of different pastors are going to be in the Psalms and Proverbs uh, and unfolding God's word in the wisdom literature uh, to us this morning. So it's appropriate uh, when you think about playlists or mixtapes, there are a number of different kinds. And one of uh, the ones that is impactful for me, you look at my phone, you can see playlists that are workout mixes, have an anniversary mix, songs that are significant for Cheryl and I, um, have a worship mix, those kinds of things. But as you think about it, one of the, one of the road trip mixes and the one that we're going to think about today is the family road trip. And what are some significant songs and, and refrains in that road trip? So before coming to Richmond, my wife Cheryl and I lived in Columbia, South Carolina for almost 18 years. And our family is in Virginia Beach, Virginia. My mom is in the same house that I grew up in. Cheryl's parents are there too. So from Columbia to Virginia Beach is about six hours. There's really no way to cut it down to get it any faster. And so you think about that kind of family road trip. When you're headed back to see family for a significant event or a holiday, uh, we knew every rest area between Columbia and Virginia Beach, right? You had to know where to pull off, use the restroom. We also knew where every Chick-fil-A was along that stop as well, right? You have to have your priorities, keep your kids satisfied. So the other thing is when you think about that drive, we would hit exit 11 off of I-95, which is for Emporia, and we begin that journey on 58 towards Virginia Beach. And when, you, when we began to hit 58 and got on there, it began to build in terms of excitement. We knew we were coming home to see family when we knew that there was a, a building anticipation for what we were going to be celebrating, whether that was Thanksgiving or Christmas or just being together with family. So today's psalm that we are going to look at is, is a family road trip psalm. It's Psalm 121. It's on page 516 in your pew Bibles. And I'm going to read it for us and then I'm going to pray and we will jump in and see what the Lord has for us today. This is Psalm 121, verses 1 to 8, a song of ascents. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we want to know you more. And in doing that, Lord, we know that our focus on ourselves needs to decrease. And so, Lord, I, I pray this morning as we look at this psalm, Jesus, that you would increase, that we would draw strength from your word. I pray for the strength now to, to proclaim what you put on my heart. May you speak, Holy Spirit, to us this morning through your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 121 is in a collection of psalms in the Psalter. It's a group of 15 psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, which you will see noted in your Bibles that says the Psalm of Ascents. These psalms were sung specifically as the people were on a road trip, on a journey together. And so it has both an immediate context it also has a context of worship, and it has a context for our life. So let's think about each of these different contexts. Again, in Exodus 23, the Lord had commanded the Israelites three times a year to come from where they were living in the nation of Israel and make a journey, a road trip to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. 
Exodus 23 talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the Harvest, or Weeks, and the Feast of Ingathering, or Booths. And so the expectation was during those times and for those feasts, you would pack up your things as a family. You were living together and you would begin that journey towards Jerusalem. And so this is an actual road trip with family and friends that would be familiar. And as you're moving together, it would be familiar for you to see other families along the way. And, and it's, you're building that anticipation. It's also a journey that is literally an ascent. And so if you think about Jerusalem, it sits about 3,400 feet above sea level. And so from most places in the nation of Israel, you are going to be moving up to Jerusalem. If you think about Skyline Drive and driving over the Blue Ridge Parkway on I-64, the highest peak or the highest point on Skyline Drive is about 3,600 feet. So if you've been over, I've been over 64 recently, seen the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so it's, it's roughly about that height that you're moving up, so it is an ascent. Again, another context to think about is the ascent to worship. The Lord in Psalm 24, 8 says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? And so for the the people who are moving to worship, there is an ascent of saying, we are coming up to worship the Lord in his temple. There is an ascent, an aspect of coming before the Lord humbly, with reverence and awe as we ascend to worship. There's also a sense that this psalm of ascents is for us throughout our entire life. And we see that in verses 7 and 8 where it says, The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So it's not just this one time that they were singing this psalm, but it was throughout their lives as they would come and go regularly for these annual feasts. There was a sense that this psalm communicates significance for the people throughout their entire lives and for us as well. So as we think about this, we want to jump in. There's going to be four major points that we're going to look at. The psalmist in verse one asks a key question. Where does our help come from? So we're going to spend some time looking at that and looking at the answer to that question. Where does our help come from? And then in verses 3 to 8, the psalmist, in answering that question, where does our help come from, reminds us of how the Lord is our keeper. He is the one who protects and guides and directs our lives. And so we're going to see the Lord keeps us, his keeping of us is constant. The Lord's keeping of us is comprehensive, and the Lord's keeping of us is confidence producing. So let's go ahead and jump in and look at the verses one and two. It says, I lift my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So as we answer this question from where does our help come from, it's important for us to think about a few things before we jump into that question. First, we need to know, what are the hills? I lift my eyes to the hills. What does that mean for the psalmist? And what does it mean for us to lift up our eyes? And then finally, what is our help and where does it come from? So let's think about these things for just a few minutes. The hills are a little bit of a mystery in Scripture. There's not a, a clear reference, but we know that this, these, this set of psalms were sung literally as the people were on a journey in the hills, right? And so this journey is not going to be I-64 where you jump in the minivan and drive across the mountains quickly, right? The farthest, you know, people would be traveling could be 90 miles. It may, it will take multiple days. It would be hot. It would be a narrow path. There would be ravines. There'd be a number of things, of features along walking along the path and moving up to that elevation to the city of Jerusalem. So the, the hills represent points of anxiety. We know that the hills in scripture, Jesus as he told the parable of the Good Samaritan was saying, as the man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he fell among thieves. And so we know as the people were making this journey that there was danger. There were robbers, there was wild animals, there was uncertainty. And so when we think about what these hills mean, we can think about there's some fear, there's some uncertainty, there's some anxiety as it's associated with the hills. But there's also anticipation, right? 
The people had made this journey year after year. And they're, like we were talking about the journey, that family road trip, there was an anticipation of coming to worship the Lord. And to do that with your family and friends and people you hadn't seen for a little while. And so there was anticipation, right? And for us, as we think about the psalm and what the Lord is saying to us today, it's important for us to realize that much of our lives is lived in between anxiety and fear and anticipation, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, I have a meeting at 9 a.m. with some important people at the university, and we're trying to figure some things out. There's a sense of fear and anxiety, I'm, uh, anticipation. I'm, I'm not quite ready for that meeting. But later in the week, this time next week, I'm going to be on vacation with my family, right? There's a sense of anticipation. So does this, does this meeting really matter tomorrow? We live our lives in between those points of, of fear, anxiety, uncertainty about what's there, and anticipation of the future. And so the hills represent both of those areas for us. What about our eyes? Sight frequently in Scripture is referred to as, as understanding, spiritual understanding. And so when we think about Psalm 19, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Enlightening the eyes is referencing our understanding. The precepts of the Lord are right. They rejoice our heart and they give us enlightenment, understanding. Or Psalm 119, 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And so we see again this idea that the eyes, I lift my eyes, we, it's about understanding. But Jesus also helps clarify for us the eyes and references it in relationship to faith. If you remember in John 9, Jesus heals a man who was born blind from birth. He sends him away to a pool and tells him to wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man obeys and is healed. His, he was born blind, but now he sees. And the Pharisees begin to ask, well, how did this happen? Wasn't this the man who was born blind? How did this miracle happen? They get in a back and forth. And eventually, the, the Pharisees kick him out of the synagogue. And Jesus goes and finds him in John chapter 9, verse 35, and says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he, he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And so again, as we see Jesus explaining what happened here, he's saying that this man, he had faith to believe. His eyes were opened. He saw that Jesus was the Messiah. And so as we think about lifting our eyes to the hills, it's the eyes of spiritual understanding, but it's the eyes of faith. We're putting our hope not in ourselves. We're lifting our eyes, our faith, our understanding. Where does our help come from? This idea of help uh, is the word ezer in scripture. It, it references protection and guidance and blessing. And certainly most immediately, as the people were leaving to go up to Jerusalem to worship, they were asking the Lord, where does my help in this journey come from? Where does my protection for the journey? Am I going to make it safely? Think about the, the word help and help that we have. We, we need help all the time, right? And I think we need help in some specific ways. First, we need help to be timely. We need it when we need it, right? And we also need the person who is providing the help to have the ability to help us, right? Um, and we also need it to be a priority for that person and that they can actually address the problem. So for me, last Monday, I was finishing work at VCU and walking to my car, and I had to be somewhere at six o'clock. So I was focused in knowing that I had to get home. And when I got in my car, I pushed the button and nothing happened. The car, you could tell, was wanting to turn over, but th there was something wrong. It wouldn't start. And so I had to call VCU police and ask them to come and to jump the car. Thankfully, the timing was right on point. Like I didn't have to wait an hour, which would have put all of my plans in jeopardy but they came in a timely way. 
They whipped out, instead of jumper cables, they had a little box, they connected, connected it to the battery, and, it, and the, the car started. And they made my car a priority, right? They didn't just sort of take their time. They, they were willing to help. And the car started, which was great. The next morning when I went to start the car again, not, the problem was not fixed. <laughs> so I had to get the car jumped into the shop. And when we brought it to the shop, they were able to replace the battery and actually fix the car. So when we think about help and where our help comes from, we need someone who can actually address the problem that we have, the help that we need. And we think about the world. The world encourages us to, encourages us to find help in a number of different ways, right? The, the, the world would say, Put your, find your help in technology, right? It aids us in so many different ways. It makes life easier. And yet it always adds to our burden at some point too, right? It can, it can be complicated and we have to relearn things. It can be used for both good and bad purposes. It doesn't always fix all of our problems. Or you think about the world and say, put your help in money. Find your help there. Again, there's a limit to how much money can provide or power. The world would say, put your, put your hope in yourself, right? Find your identity, find your hope within you. Prioritize your needs and your identity first, and that is the way to true help. The issue with all of these things is that they don't fix the problem. They do not address the real problem, which Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart of man, our hearts are desperately wicked. They cannot fix the problem just looking inside of ourselves. We need help externally, which is good because it's why the psalmist, the next phrase says, my help comes from the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us and calling us to, to see this morning. The word for Lord here and the word for Lord used five other times or five times total in this psalm is the name Yahweh. It is God's covenant name. And so when we see where our help comes from, God is saying to us in this psalm, it comes from his faithful, steadfast, promise-keeping love. That our help comes from the Lord. We see that he goes on and says, it comes from the Lord, our steadfast covenant-keeping God, who made heaven and earth. He is the creator of all things. Sitting here right now, if you were to put your hands together or touch your arm, we as human beings are made up of between 17 and 38 trillion cells. We can't see them Directly, you have to use a microscope to see them, but these cells in our bodies are doing multiple tasks with other cells in multiple ways. They're protecting us, they're keeping us breathing, the blood flowing, all of that by the hand of the Lord. You think about the cosmos, and Sean and I recently had a chance to go up to D.C. and go to the Air and Space Museum. We watched an IMAX film on the our solar system, and one of the planets in our solar system, Jupiter, captured my attention. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, and so it can fit over a thousand Earths in the size of Jupiter. And it rotates, its day is not a 24-hour day, it's a 12 and a half hour day. It's spinning really fast. It takes 12 years to make a rotation around the, the sun. And it has moons and gases. It's being held together. And the Lord says in Colossians 1.6 that Jesus is holding everything together by the word of his power. From the very cells in our body to the planets, he knows every star by name. So when we think about the, the issues that we face, where we need help in our lives today, you know that for yourself. It could be help in raising kids. It could be help in a job situation that is uncertain or a, a marriage that is not going well. You're not able to communicate well. Our help comes from the Lord. He is the one who holds all power, authority, and he is the one who is able to help us. And so I would encourage you, if you are here this morning and you don't know the Lord, to see him as the one who made you and the one who has rescued us 
by the blood of his son. And I would encourage you to put your hope and your trust in this God who is able to help us today. Well, as we look at God's help, his keeping power, the psalmist brings these refrains in verses 3 to 8 together and reminds us six times of God's keeping. So six more times in verses 3 to 8, it says the Lord, that covenant name of God, keeps us. And this word for keeping is a word, again, that means protection. It means um, that, he, that God is our help. It is primary. It is personal. It is powerful. And so we need to ask ourselves, we need to look and see that God is, his keeping of us is constant, it is comprehensive, and it is confidence producing. So let's look at verse 3 and 4. God's keeping, the Lord's keeping of us is constant. So verses 3 and 4, he says, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will, neither, will, will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So he will not let your foot be moved would have practical relevance for the people as they were journeying up to Jerusalem. Again, these were narrow paths. These were not I-64. And so there would have been danger of a misstep. For me, when I'm hiking, it's not as much about the going up. It's more about the coming down, right? I'm looking for rocks of maybe that I'll slip out and fall or a route that I may turn my ankle on or things like that. But this is saying, the Lord is saying, he will not let your foot be moved. He will keep you. His keeping of you, his protection and help is step by step by step by step in our lives. He who keeps you will not slumber. He will neither slumber nor sleep. I have two kids, and one of the more challenging things about parenting is when your kids cry out to you in the night, right? Growing up, after the kids, when they were at that age where they're able to call for help, I found out that my wife had gone behind my back and trained our kids to call out for me, to call out for dad in the middle of the night. I sleep on the side of the bed closest to the door. And so my kids are sick. Dad, uh, you know, like they're going to get to the bathroom in time. My kids are, need a glass of water. Dad, they're woken up by a, a, a scary dream. Dad. And so you think about waking up in the middle of the night, right? My help at that point for them was not always the best help, right? You wake up and you're like, What's happening? <laughs> and like you stumble out of bed and hit the door and you're trying to figure out what's going on and what they need at that moment. It's not a perfect help, right? Our God never sleeps or slumbers. There's never a time in our lives where he is taking a nap, where his care is not constant in his provision and his providing for us. This is in contrast to the gods around the nation of Israel. If you remember in Samuel, the prophet Elijah is challenging the prophets of Baal to say, who is the true God? And it's a challenge of the God who responds by fire. That is the true and living God. And as, as the prophets of Baal try and call upon Baal, Baal doesn't answer. He's not a true God. And so... Elijah kind of mocks him and says, well, maybe he's using the bathroom or maybe he's sleeping, right? And so again, it's a stark contrast between the living God of the universe who answers his people and who is, whose care for us is constant. It is step by step and it is continual, day and night, day and night. We face very real challenges and problems, but in our lives. But this morning, God is reminding us that his keeping of us is constant. His keeping for us is also comprehensive. And we see this in verses 5 and 6. And so when we think about it, it says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. So again, he's reiterating again, the Lord, Yahweh, covenant-keeping God, is your keeper. He keeps reminding us. 
It's a song that needs to be on our playlist that we listen to quite frequently. But he says, the Lord is your shade at your right hand, on your right hand. It's a sunny day outside. If we were to go outside, all of us would have a shadow that follows us, stays with us. And that image is what God wants to communicate to us today. He is the cosmic God of the universe who holds all power and authority, but is intimate, is personal, and is at our right hand. He is right there with us to help us in our times of need. He also says not only that he is the shade on our right hand, but he says the sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Now I'll say spending a lot of time out in the sun as an Irishman with fair skin is not a great idea for me. I will burn within about five to 10 minutes. So I need, to, I need the 75 to 100 sunscreen, right? If you remember for the people, right, they are making a journey that is gonna take multiple days putting them outside. And so the sun would beat down on them. They would feel the heat of the sun. When they go to sleep at night, what, what does that moon represent? It, it's certainly the cold and sort of the, the night, but it also can, can be a little bit of the, the fear that can come from the unknown at night. The, the sounds seem a little bit scarier. Things seem a little more mysterious at night. And so when the Lord says that he, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night, it's a contrast, which for us is designed to say, the sun by day, the moon by night, and everything in between. There is not a place in our lives that God does not provide comprehensive care for us. When we think about this for my life, we moved to Richmond in the summer of 2015. For several months leading up to the time we moved, we had been praying about moving back to Virginia. Both my mom and my wife's family are getting older. I'm an only child. I wanted to be closer. So I began to look for jobs. I work in higher education at universities from UVA in Charlottesville down to ODU or Virginia Wesleyan in Virginia Beach. Wanted to be somewhere in a closer proximity than six hours. So we began to pray and ask, would this be what the Lord would want? And so as I was applying for jobs, I, I didn't find a lot. And so I got a job offer or an interview um, with VCU to engage in some work in community engagement. And it was something that I had been doing at University of South Carolina where I had been. And so I applied and got an interview. I got an on-campus interview. And so I really connected with the people in the interview. I loved uh, the idea of working at VCU and working to support students as they got out into the community. But I got a call from the hiring manager about a week after I interviewed and said, we've gone a different direction. We're, we're, we're not going to be able to hire you. And it was heartbreaking. You know, I, I had put my time and energy. I was excited about this opportunity, but the door was closed. But in that moment, the hiring manager also said, but we really enjoyed connecting with you. And there's a position that's open that is coming open in a different unit, which is related to what this job was about. Would you be okay if I recommended you for that position? Someone who I had not met, Kathy Howard, we had not met before that, that interview process, who went to bat for me and talked to the hiring manager and said, you should consider this person. I applied for the job and it ended up being the position that the Lord opened for me at VCU where I started. And so you think about that that need and, and the desire that we had to move, but then you think about all the other details which go into move, moving and moving a family, no doubt, right? So we had to sell our house in South Carolina. We were concerned, would we be able to sell it in a, just a short period of time? I got the job in June, we had to be here in August. What about the kids' schooling? Both Laura and Mark, M Laura, had, we had applied for a school and Laura got in, but Mark's class was full. There, there was not an opportunity for him to be at the same school with Laura. We were, we were like, Lord, how do we think about this? But just a few weeks later after we applied, a spot opened for Mark. And so again, and there were times where we were worried about, well, Cheryl, would she be able to find work? There was a head of school, she works in early childhood, so there was a head of school from a place she had worked at in South Carolina who was already here in Richmond. She was able to reconnect and started to build a relationship and found work at that school. Again, these are personal details for us, 
But there are specific ways in which God provided comprehensive care for us. And the same thing is true for you. I hope that you have points in your life and your experience in walking with the Lord where you have seen his comprehensive care for you in whatever the area that you can go back to and remember and rehearse again and again and again. Whether it's sun or moon or everywhere else in between, God's care for us is comprehensive. Lastly, his care for us is confidence producing. And we see that in these last two verses, verses seven and eight. It says, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth, now and forevermore. So by this point in the sermon, hopefully you are being reminded of God's keeping care for us his protection, his care. But some of you may be saying, look, Jimmy, this is great. I appreciate knowing the truth about who God is, but this does not match my experience right now. How can the Lord say that he will keep you from all evil when I am experiencing pain, suffering, hardship right now? It does not seem like this verse is true. The important thing for us is to look at the verse and to see that the verb tense in this verse has shifted from the present to the future. And so the Lord is not saying to us that we will never experience pain or suffering or the effects of sin in our life. We know that from other scripture that we are going to go through hardship, through pain, through things that seem confusing. But what this verse is saying to us is that the Lord will keep you now and future tense, he will keep you from all evil and he will keep your life. That word for life we find in verse seven is the word for soul. The Lord will keep your soul. How does the Lord keep our souls? The Lord keeps our souls through the person and work of Jesus. And so this psalm moves us from thinking about the Lord as the covenant-keeping God right to Christ. If you think about Ephesians 2, it says that what was our condition before Christ? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were God's enemies. We were deserving of God's wrath. We had no hope for a future. Our hope was death and judgment. But how does God keep our soul? We find that in in, in the verse in Ephesians which says, but God, being rich in mercy, he loved us. He sent his son to die for us as the propitiation and the sacrifice for our sin. And he has made us alive with Christ. Death is defeated. Our souls are being kept by Christ Right now, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and he will keep us for all eternity. Our souls are being kept by the living Jesus. And that's helpful for us right now in our lives today because we still struggle with indwelling sin in our lives. And one of the ways we can think about God's soul keeping in Jesus is, for, is Philippians 1 6, which says, He who began a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. And that work may seem far off, but you can count on the fact that God's keeping power, all that we've talked about today, will bring the work that he has started in you to completion when Christ comes again. Hallelujah. That is good news for us. And we see in the Gospel of John that as Jesus is our good shepherd, as he calls us and knows us by name, that nothing and no one can snatch us out of Jesus' hands. That our souls are being kept by Jesus and that that we we are preserved, we persevere because of what Christ has done for us. And there is nothing and no one that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And as we move to to close this morning, I think it's helpful for us as we think about God's keeping power and care in our lives to, to think about 
Paul's words to the Romans in Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. And so I'm going to read these for us. And I want you just to to let the words that Paul is saying to the Romans just settle on you in light of all that we've been talking about today. In light of the very real situations that you are going through right now. Our God is for us. He is near to us. He is able to help. This is Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Amen. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us right now and for all eternity. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Church, this morning, I don't know your individual situations, whether you're in that state right now of being overwhelmed and anxious, or whether you're anticipating something that's coming up and you're excited about that. Be reminded today that the Lord Jesus is the one who keeps and sustains us, that his keeping of us is constant, it is comprehensive, and it is confidence-producing. Let's turn to him in trust and in worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us today. I pray, Lord, that you would bring it back to our minds again and again and again. I know how forgetful I am. I can walk out of here later today and face the situation and and doubt whether it's good or whether you're good or whether you will keep us. But God, remind us, may, may your word and your truth from Psalm 121, may it be a song that you bring back to our mind again and again and again. And I thank you that you are at work in us, Jesus, to finish the good work that you've started. And I thank you that we are safe and secure because you have rescued us You have paid for our sin and you have made us alive with you forever, Jesus. And so, Lord, we want to celebrate and worship and take confidence and find joy in what we've heard from you this morning. We ask these things in your name. Amen.